From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Well, President Biden has returned to the White House to some pretty welcome news, I suspect, with a new poll out from NPR and Marist College indicating that the president's approval rates are starting to tick up at this point. This poll was taken after the State of the Union address, which may be important here. But to bring us up to date on where the pre president is in the polling, we turn now to our Washington correspondent, Joe Matthew. He's host of Sound On weekdays on Bloomberg Radio. So it may have been a long time coming, but it looks like for whatever reason, maybe people are starting to come around a little toward Joe Biden. Yeah, that's that's true, David. The headline reads pretty easy. The highest approval ratings in over a year. And you're right. This poll from Marist, NPR and PBS was taken last week after the State of the Union address, which is something for this White House to celebrate. And I'm sure that they are internally. The numbers look like this. Remembering that we're coming out of a pretty deep hole here. This uh, overall approval at 46 percent, 49 percent among registered voters, which is a more important metric that we follow. The highest in a year and up from a bottom of about 36 percent last July. That is pretty important perspective here, David, as you think of it kind of like a stock coming out of a bear market here. The comps are pretty easy. On the other hand, President Biden is still underwater. He's under 50 percent and his support among independents is only at 36 percent. That's something that could be a cause for concern getting into uh, an election cycle here. More encouraging, though, as Joe Biden considers the potential of running for re-election, the number of Democrats who want someone else to run has fallen to 45 percent. David, that's down almost 10 points from before the midterm elections when Democrats were crying for someone else. But the poll didn't only cover uh, President Biden. It also had something to say about Donald Trump, his rival, if, in mm -hmm. fact, Joe Biden decides to run. Donald Trump said he is going to run again. What does it say about Donald Trump's support? Well, nothing very good. These have been very stubborn numbers for Trump. His overall approval ratings have been sliding a bit, as some others, including, yes, I think you're referring to Ron DeSantis here, consider getting into the race. We saw Nikki Haley jump in and others over the past week or so here. Those Republicans in this poll who say they would have a better chance winning the election with someone other than Trump is 54%. That's a number I bet he'd like to trade with Joe Biden if he had the opportunity. He shows particular weakness among college-educated voters, David, people making over $50,000 a year, and parents with kids under 18. It just so happens that those groups tend to prefer a guy named Ron DeSantis, making it pretty clear that, indeed, if the governor of Florida jumps in, it's going to be a knockdown, drag-out fight for that nomination. Joe, thank you so very much. That's Bloomberg's own Joe Matthew. You want to catch him at 5 p.m. Eastern time today on Sound On on Bloomberg Radio. And now to get a sense of how the politics might intersect with the policy in Washington, we welcome Lily, Libby Cantrill. She is head of public policy at PIMCO. Libby, great to have you back on. Uh, this, this poll was taken after the State of the Union, but before the president's trip over to Ukraine and Poland, which I, I don't know might even further indicate some support. As the president comes back, what sort of uh, mojo does he have to deal with Congress? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he. Um, I think think what which was on display in terms of the the State of the Union uh, was quite a lot of mojo. Uh, he had quite a lot of energy, so not really that surprising that he saw a bit of a bump in his polling. Actually, last year uh, when his polling was quite beleaguered, he also saw a several point bump after the State of the Union. Now we'll have to see what how kind of what longevity that those those uh, elevated poll ratings have, because oftentimes it's just a bit of a bump and then they kind of revert uh, to the mean. Um, but, but, David, you're exactly right that he, he needs this mojo in many ways in order to deal with, of course, what is a divided government. He had a unified government uh, last year, but now he has, of course, a divided Congress. So trying to navigate uh, that is going to be you know, trickier. So in some ways, he needs all of this sort of public support uh, that he can get, especially going into what may be a re-election cycle, although we don't know yet. You know he hasn't uh, he hasn't indicated whether he's going to be running or not. Or yet. No, he's keeping us waiting on that for sure. So, so let me, let's talk about whatever momentum he may have, what he may need to use it for. And I guess as long as we're talking about his return from Poland and Ukraine, let's talk about that first. Uh, are there things he needs to get out of this Congress with respect to support for Ukraine? Yeah, I mean, I think that in many ways, you know, his trip to to Ukraine um, was, you know, was quite you know, objectively quite courageous. Uh, it included, a, you know, a 10-hour train ride 
um, in a country where the U.S. doesn't control the airspace. It was, uh, you know, really pretty unprecedented in terms of, of presidential, you know, modern history, uh, having a president sort of uh, be vulnerable that way. Um, but it was, I think, in some ways as, um, as important sort of substantively to reassure Ukraine that the divided Congress, that the United States, uh, even with the sort of change in government in Congress, will continue to support Ukraine, but also politically um, was, you know, sort of symbolic having uh, President Biden there in Kyiv with, uh, with President Zelensky. So um, I think in some ways, um, if he is going to be running for re-election, uh, things like this, uh, sort of the symbolism of, again, appearing with Zelensky in Ukraine uh, can only help in terms of his, you know, his re-election candidacy. Uh, Libby, let's talk about the big one, at least the one that everybody on Bloomberg keeps paying attention to, and that is the debt ceiling and the possibility of default. Everybody seems to agree we're not going to do it, but nobody can figure out how we're not going to do it. Uh, what does the president need to get done there, and what's the path to success? Yeah, well, he, you know, unlike President Obama in 2011, who, you know, indicated that he was open to negotiating over the debt ceiling, using the debt ceiling potentially as a as a tool to uh, restrain spending and increase taxes back in 2011. 2023 is very different under this president, who has basically, you know, maintained very consistently that he will not negotiate over the debt ceiling, potentially learning a lesson from 2011, who knows? Um, so, so I think he will continue that stance. And, you know, David, I think it's really important, this is what we're you know, telling our clients, is that the zeitgeist of 2023 is quite different from 2011, which is, of course, the last time where there was a big debt ceiling standoff. Sort of the politics of austerity don't really exist as much as they did back in sort of the Tea Party element. And really importantly is Republicans have a much smaller majority uh, in this House than they did back in 2011. So, you know, much less leverage in some ways in terms of getting concessions. So, you know, we would agree with the consensus that there will be, you know, common sense will prevail here, or there will be a resolution. It may not be until the last moment. It may, you know, cause some market volatility. Um, but again, we are confident that there will be a resolution again by this sort of so-called X date, whenever that may be, uh, between sort of June and September. We'll uh, we'll just have to wait for clarity on that. Libby, just to make sure I understand this, and we just had that CBO report out, which at least for some of us was pretty alarming at how much deficit we're adding up. And it seems to be getting more and more as time goes on. It's not getting better and better. Uh, what I think I hear you saying is, in, in all likelihood, you think the, the most likely path is we'll muddle through. We won't really address the fundamental underlying problems, but we won't shut down the government. Yeah, and I think that this is like the, the important part, uh, you know, David, that, that President Biden has said as well, is that let's not negotiate over the debt ceiling. Of course, the debt ceiling is simply uh, allowing for the government to raise debt to honor spending that's already been uh, agreed to. If there is going to be a future spending discussion, then let's do it over uh, the fiscal year 2024 uh, spending bill, which will need to be negotiated before before October, of course. So I think he's trying to separate those two. But as you know, as well as I do, David, that um, really eating the, around the edges in terms of discretionary spending will not move the trajectory for the deficit. Really, it, it will entail a really hard look at entitlement spending, Social Security and Medicare in particular, according to that CBO report, and then also interest expense, which is uh, also eating up some of the, uh, you know, of the deficit and what have you. So, um, but, you know, President Biden and and Republicans have already admitted that those things are really the third rail, are kind of off the table in terms of, of discussion. So I think the bottom line that we're telling our clients is if there are any spending cuts, there will they will be very de minimis and will unlikely move uh, the needle in terms of the, the deficit trajectory, because really in order to do that, you have to tackle entitlement spending. And again, as we all know, politically, that's just sort of the, the third rail in Washington right now. Yeah, it's sort of extraordinary. All the economists say you have to address entitlements and the Republicans and the Democrats don't even want to bring the subject up. They won't even talk about it, much less deal with it. So when you get through all of that, Libby, is there bandwidth left over either for actually some bipartisan legislation on things like cryptocurrency or police reform, some of the other things that we've been talking about that maybe there's some overlap with, or is it really going to be oversight, oversight, oversight? Well, I think we are going to we're going to see a lot of oversight. And we're already seeing that beginning. I do also think that there could be, um, you know, there is sort of some bipartisan unanimity around uh, China as well. So you could sort of see, um, you know, both sides of the aisle come together in terms of 
oversight on some of those policies. But David, I think it is really important to um, to emphasize that this, you know, this Washington maybe is not as polarized as you know we might think it is if you're reading social media or even uh, watching cable television. Um, at last you know, session of Congress, actually there were several bipartisan bills that got passed. Now, of course, the dynamics in this Congress look a little different, but I do think that there is you know, some potential agreement around cryptocurrency. I think there's some need about uh, regulatory jurisdiction lines in, in particular. Energy permitting reform, that could also be something where we could see some compromise, and then potentially on police reform. Now, again, these are all potentials, these are all theoreticals, but I do think that um, you know, maybe there is some more common space than we might think if you just, again, are reading social media and uh, get, a, get a more polarized characterization of Washington, D.C. Let me finally, do you have any sense at this point of the relationship, the working relationship between Hakeem Jeffries, the new uh, minority leader in the House, and uh, Mr. McCarthy, the new Speaker of the House? Because that may be a critical relationship going forward. Well, of course, they're both in new positions. Um, so these are, you know, they're, they're, I think, probably sympathetic to one another that uh, they are both uh, sort of transitioning to leadership positions. Um, you know, at the same at the same time, and um, you know, I think that you know both of them have a collegial relationship. They both obviously f served in the House and in different capacities in leadership before, um, and I think that there is they both have some incentives to show that they can actually work together. So again, even though the focus is on the debt ceiling, which is a very you know divisive. Uh, uh, issue right now, um, I do think that they're both, um, you know, engaged and um, and committed to getting some things done as well, even in this sort of divided Congress. Libby, absolutely great to have you with us. Thank you for your time. It's Libby Cantrell. Thank She's you. head of public policy at PIMCO. Coming up three weeks after the train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, the disaster continues. We're going to talk with a congressman whose district is most affected. He's Republican Bill Johnson. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Three weeks ago now, there was a train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, that involved toxic chemicals because they were worried it might explode, and so they had a controlled burn, which really contaminated the air as well as the water in the area. They're still trying to clean it up. Everyone seems to be going down there now to try to lend a hand from pre former President Donald Trump to the current Secretary of Treasury, Pete Buttigieg. But now we turn to somebody who really knows what's going on because it's his district it happened in. He's Republican Congressman Bill Johnson. Johnson of Ohio. Thank you so much, Congressman, for being with us. Y you know what's going on. So tell us from your perspective, where are we right now with the aftermath of this de derailment? Well, you know, the NTSB released a uh, preliminary report uh, today. And what we know now is the most likely suspect of this derailment was a, a failed bearing uh, unit in an axle. Uh, that overheated and basically destroyed the axle. And when the axle failed, of course, the train left the rails. Uh, I got to tell you that in the aftermath of that, uh, the first responders, uh, 78 fire departments uh, responded. They did an outstanding job of, of containing the, the, the fire and the damage. Uh, I can tell you that both the EPA, the federal EPA and the state EPA have been there since day one, uh, and and they've made remarkable progress in identifying, uh, you know, the near-term uh, most immediate containment and mitigation, uh, and then a long-term remediation plan. They're working hand in hand with Norfolk Southern to make sure Norfolk Southern understands that they are going to be held fully accountable for this. Uh, that control burn that you're talking about that was. Uh, the best of a lot of bad alternatives because some of those tank cars carrying uh, uh, vinyl uh, chloride uh, or vinyl chlorine was, uh, was, was becoming unstable. Had it exploded organically on its own, uh, it would have sent hazardous chemicals and shrapnel for as wide a range as a mile around. Uh, you would have had a lot more damage uh, possible loss of life, structural damage, uh, and, and a much worse situation than we've got now. So some good decisions were made up front. Uh, right now, today, as we speak, uh, the EPA is testing, has tested, continues to test. 
Uh, the air uh, has tested good. The water from the municipal source, the village's water system, which is tested by them all the time anyway, has tested good. It's private wells that have to be uh, that have to be tested before people should drink out of them. And none of the private well tests have shown any contamination either. So a long way to go, a long way to go uh, before uh, we're at the finish line. It will be months and years uh, before the residents of that community are uh, are going to feel safe in their homes and in their community. Well, exactly. We've all seen in the media some individuals interviewed who say they don't feel safe. They're not confident because they're not sure it's been tested enough. Uh, do you have any sense of how long it will take before the testing will be done so that you could give the necessary reassurance to all the residents that, okay, it is safe to drink the water, it is safe to, bring, to breathe the air? Well, I can tell you that those tests are going on right now. I, I've, I've drank some of the water. Uh, I did drink some of the water there in the in the village, along with the mayor, along with uh, other uh, other officials. Uh, uh, our governor has been there. He has drank the water there in the village. We've gone into people's homes and and watched the home air tests being conducted. Look, uh, we're not going to downplay any concerns that the residents have when. When the governor of Ohio, EPA administrator Michael Regan, uh, and the railroad tell the community that they are going to be there for the long haul, that we are not going to let uh, that uh, them suffer uh, without us being there with them, I tell them, let me tell you what the long haul means. You guys, the residents of this community, you're the ones that get to determine what that finish line looks like. We are not going to stop testing and retesting and retesting and validating that this cleanup has done, been done properly until you say that you're satisfied. That community didn't ask for this problem. It was, it was dumped on top of them. And we have a responsibility to make sure they're made whole again. Congressman, obviously the priority is making sure that everyone's safe there, they can live there safely, they can drink the water, they can breathe the air. Is it too soon to start asking questions about whether there could have been things done to avoid this problem to begin with? Uh, whether whether it's the sensors that maybe not did not function properly for the bearing that overheated, whether it's notification of that, about toxic chemicals going through a community, whether it's cutting back on how much toxic chemicals are shipped around, or, or should there be EPA regulations? imposed? Well, we're, we're going to be looking at all of those questions that you just asked. We're going to be looking at those questions very, very carefully. Uh, the NTSB is into that investigation now. All we know right now is the suspect is a, uh, is a failed bearing uh, housing unit on an axle. Uh, bearings fail for various reasons, uh, but they are digging in deep to the sensors that alerted the train crew uh, the engineers, that there was a problem. They're going to be looking at what the train crew's response was. Uh, and so we're going to be looking at anything and everything uh, to determine how we can make sure something like this never happens again. I have been in touch with the uh, chairman uh, of the rail uh, transportation subcommittee on the transportation and infrastructure committee in the House, both of them, the chair and the vice chair, have told me that they are sitting on go uh, once that NTSB report comes out uh, to begin looking at are there things we need to do uh, in the regulatory structure to stop something like this from happening again. And of course, you gotta you have to consider were the rules followed in the first place. I mean, uh, did things go wrong that should not have gone wrong? So, so finally, just to summarize, from your point of view, there's a lot of work left to be done. And as you say, the residents of East Palestine were not responsible for this. we got to do what we can to, to take care of them. But from your point of view right now, everybody's doing their job. Norfolk Southern, EPA, the state and, and federal regulatory agencies, as far as you're, you're getting what support you can. Well, you know, I, I've got to admit that there have been some delays in getting the federal agencies here. As you are aware, President Biden has not been here. <clears throat> the Secretary of Transportation just finally showed up today. Uh, that's a day late and a dollar short, in my opinion. Uh, FEMA initially said doesn't qualify. I wrote a letter to FEMA saying, wait a minute, if this doesn't qualify as a disaster, I don't know what does. 
you need to come here. They changed their mind. They did decide to come. So you've got FEMA on the ground. You've got HHS and CDC. You've got toxicology experts. We've got a health care clinic set up for residents uh, that can go get their health care concerns, whether it's themselves or their children, uh, looked at. Uh, so a lot of progress has been made, but, but it could have been handled much better by the administration uh, in the beginning. Only the EPA, the federal EPA, has been here since the very beginning. Yeah. Congressman, we really appreciate the update. It's very, very helpful, and uh, we wish the very best to the people of East Palestine. That's Republican Congressman Bill Johnson of Ohio. Still to come, we're going to talk with the Polish foreign minister about his country's efforts to support Ukraine. This is Bounce of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Today, the global spotlight is on India as the G20 financial leaders gather. Among the issues on the table, debt relief, inflation, climate sustainability, and more. Live coverage continues on Bloomberg, your global business authority. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, we're between the Fed minutes and the PCE numbers that we get out tomorrow. And so what are the markets doing as they wait? We turned out a pretty good different answer to that. Yeah, a little bit of a sell-off on our hands, David, today. We're seeing the S&P 500 down about four tenths of 1%. A stark contrast to the rally we had just a couple of hours ago. The market actually opened in the green, and a lot of this was driven by some positive sentiment around NVIDIA specifically. And the reason we kind of use that as our uh, poster child, our bellwether, is because not only is it a tech heavyweight, it also is kind of a global player. And that's a really important story. NVIDIA coming out and saying they had not only beat their earnings, but that they were really going and going to invest hard when it comes to AI specifically. We know that's been a very thematic trade in the tech space as well. That's been driving up shares as big as Microsoft and Alphabet to uh, even some of the smaller companies as well. But today, it's interesting. You are starting to see their, NVIDIA is announcing their partnership with the likes of Microsoft, Alphabet, Oracle, mm -hmm. actually moving their stock so much. I think it's responsible for about 40% of the S&P 500's upward movement just from wow. this one company. So it's pretty enormous. But if you look at kind of the trade-off here, a lot of the stocks that are moving the S&P 500 broadly to the bottom are your Amazon, your Teslas, uh, some of your other big tech names. So that's kind of outweighing the bid um, from NVIDIA at the moment. And a lot of this is really coming into some positioning ahead of PCE tomorrow. Yeah, you have to wonder which of the companies are going to get disrupted by this AI as NVIDIA makes its money. There may be some companies that are losers as well. Many thanks to Kriti Gupta. You can catch Kriti again anchoring at 1 p.m. Eastern time on Bloomberg Markets. Coming up, we're going to talk with the former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, Daniel Kurtzer, about the continuing upheaval over proposal to remake the Israeli judiciary. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. To keep you up to date with news from all around the world, we turn now to Lisa Mateo here with The First Word. Lisa. Thank you, David. Traders have found a way to get around European Union sanctions on Russian oil. Millions of barrels of Russian crude and fuels have been switched between tankers just a few miles off the coast of Greece. That's according to tanker tracking by Bloomberg. Greek authorities say they can't do much because the activity happens outside of Greece's ter territorial waters. Well, NATO will keep close tabs on what Russia does with its nuclear weapons after President Vladimir Putin suspended his country's participation in the new START treaty. Speaking with Bloomberg Television today, Secretary General Jan Slotenberg warned that the risk of an arms buildup. This is a, a reckless decision because we need arms control uh, and we need transparency. Uh, so uh, we call on Russia to uh, to uh, reconsider and to and to respect and to and to fully uh, implement the new START uh, agreement, including the inspection regime, which is extremely important. Uh, and then, of course, we will closely monitor what they fact actually do. And the NATO chief reiterated concerns that China was considering providing Russia with military aid, warning, "quote This would be a big and serious mistake." An unusually cold winter storm that's forecast to bring snow to the hills surrounding San Francisco and Los Angeles this week may ease dry conditions, but it won't be enough to end the historic drought. Meteorologists say it will take several years of wet winters for the state to return to normal levels. 
Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Lisa. So we're going to turn now to Israel, where the tensions remain high over the new uh, administration led by Bibi Netanyahu's efforts to reform the judiciary, as well as various actions taken in the West Bank and Palestinian territories. To bring us up to speed on exactly where things are right now, we turn to Daniel Kurtzer. He's former U.S. ambassador to Israel and to Egypt. So thank you so much for being with us, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, so you've spent a good part of your career in this part of the world really understanding it. Give us your sense of uh, whether this is just another one, because we've seen these sort of things before, or is it different? I think there are differences on both elements. Uh, the assault on the judiciary uh, now uh, being undertaken by this coalition would change the basic balance of power within the Israeli domestic political uh, system. Uh, currently, the uh, the uh, executive and legislative powers uh, rest in the coalition. And what the coalition wants to do is to curb the power of the judiciary to uh, review and possibly overturn legislation, uh, which would effectively make a governing coalition uh, the sole power within the system. And that's why hundreds of thousands of Israelis have gone out on the streets to protest. They understand the impact that this would have on uh, on the democratic freedoms that they uh, they cherish. Now, the reality is there there is a need for some uh, judicial reform, and that's why the president of Israel, uh, Herzog, has called for discussions and negotiations. But uh, there's been a first reading of some legislation already suggesting that the coalition may plow ahead. And of course, the other crisis that you alluded to is uh, happening in the West Bank. Uh, individual Palestinians are engaged in uh, acts of terrorism. Israel is responding quite harshly. They're also acting preemptively in uh, some of the cities, including Nablus, just yesterday. And the situation is heating up very seriously on the ground. So taking those in order, if we could, with respect to judicial reform, uh, obviously that is a major governance, even constitutional issue for the people of Israel. But we're also seeing it reflected, I believe, uh, in the business community. We've seen some tech officials really express concerns about what this sort of undermining the judiciary, I, those are my words, not from <laughs> Minister Netanyahu's, but what it could mean for investment in tech. We even saw it perhaps affect the currency. Well, you know better than I that uh, investors uh, look for strong uh, judicial protections, and they look for a strong system that can ensure that they can get their money out and that they're protected and so forth. Uh, if the judicial system in Israel uh, proceeds as the current coalition wants to, to proceed, uh, it will drive away investors who will be nervous about the protections that they would they would like. It's also going to impact, I think, the tech sector, which is quite sensitive to uh, these kinds of changes. And uh, given the uh, transportability of uh, technology, you might start to see uh, Israeli tech firms uh, moving out as well as uh, tech experts moving out. We're already seeing, according to the press, a uh, significant uh, movement of capital outside of Israel uh, in uh, anticipation of these changes. So there's a big economic impact that the government is going to have to consider. Uh, so uh, you know well, uh, Mr. Netanyahu, the current prime minister, has shown over many years an ability to take power, hold power, use power. He's a very astute politician. As he looks at it from his point of view, is he more nervous about what I can call, sir, consider the right in his coalition or more concerned about the tech sector? You know, on the one hand, uh, Netanyahu was a very good finance minister back in uh, the early 2000s when I was serving as ambassador. He took some very hard decisions, and he really uh, righted a ship that was beginning to uh, to list uh, and did quite well. So he knows the impact that uh, these changes could have. On the other hand, uh, the primary purpose uh, for which he assembled this coalition was to try to evade his legal issues. You know, he's under indictment and court cases have already started related to corruption. And uh, this coalition has promised to pass legislation that would uh, remove that uh, uh, Damoclean sword uh, over his head. So he's caught between these two, these two imperatives. One is make sure the economy doesn't run into a problem, and the other, his own personal uh, liabilities and potential uh, criminal 
liabilities and the corruption cases. And finally, Mr. Ambassador, let's turn to the, the other issue that you identified, the raid on Nablus on Wednesday. Then I understand there was more on Gaza. There have been some missiles fired back. Uh, is it a priority for the Netanyahu government to avoid another intifada? Well, Netanyahu himself clearly would not want an intifada, because if anything's going to disrupt Israel's progress domestically in its economy, as well as the progress toward building relations with Arab states, it would be another uh, outbreak of uh, organized warfare with Palestinians. On the other hand, there are members of his coalition on the far right who are not concerned about another intifada because they may want to use that to begin pushing Palestinians uh, further away from uh, the possibility of exercising power or even pushing them out of the country, uh, deporting them and so forth. So you have a mixture of the views within the coalition. And this will be one of the main tests for Netanyahu. Can he control the coalition enough on this issue to prevent escalation? And so far, it's not looking that good uh, with these uh, preemptive strikes in Nablus and then uh, a couple of weeks ago in Janine that have uh, raised the temperature quite significantly. And, and finally, Mr. Ambassador, does the United States have the capital to make a difference in this issue? Uh, and if it does have the capital, is it willing to use it? I saw that, in fact, there was criticism of the raid in Nablus on Wednesday. Well, yes and no. I mean, we have the capital. Um, we are still uh, the major power in the Middle East. We carry a great deal of weight in, uh, in what we uh, say and what we do. Uh, but uh, this administration, as much as it has tried to keep uh, the violence uh, down and to try to uh, work with Israel, uh, has so many other priorities that the parties in the region are understanding that they can get away with things and really not worry about the administration coming down too hard on them. You remember, however, David, that in 2021, when there was a war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza, uh, the administration had to act and put everything else aside. So there's only a limit to uh, the reluctance on the part of the administration to act and uh, so far, uh, we've seen some behind-the-scenes diplomacy, but that doesn't seem to have done the trick to uh, prevent escalation. Thank you so very much for being with us. This is very helpful. It's Daniel Kurtzer. He's former U.S. ambassador to Israel and Egypt and now at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. Coming up, as President Biden returns from Warsaw, we're going to talk with the foreign, but with the foreign policy, the foreign minister for Poland. He is Bignif Rao about what his nation is doing to aid the Ukrainian effort. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. President Biden has just returned from his historic trip over to Europe, where he visited Ukraine and Poland. Just yesterday, he reiterated why this conflict in Ukraine is so important, not just for Ukraine, but for the rest of the world. Because what literally is at stake is not just Ukraine, it's freedom. The idea that over 100,000 forces would invade another country after war, since World War II, nothing like that has happened. Things have changed radically. We have to we have to make sure we change them back. We welcome now someone whose country is very close to the front lines of that conflict. He is Zbigniew Rao, the foreign minister of Poland. So, Mr. Foreign Minister, thank you so much for being here. Your country, thank as you I for say, having me. you're very close to this conflict, and you've stepped up both in supporting Ukraine and allowing refugees in. Tell us from your perspective, with the president's trip over to Ukraine and then that speech in Warsaw that we all watched. What's the most important thing about this trip for Poland? The most important thing about this trip is that this was a historic event that confirmed three, three things. First, that Ukraine belongs to the free world. Second, that the free world is showing unprecedented unity. And the third one, is that the United States is confirming its leadership of the free world. And what we heard in Kiev and later on in Warsaw from President Biden can be seen 
as one, I would say, of three speeches that defined the commitments of the free world to the issue of freedom, democracy, territorial integrity, national independence, and so on. The first, the first speech of this kind was a speech delivered by uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy in Berlin when he said, as you recall it, Ich bin ein Berliner. The second one was that delivered by Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. when he said, standing before the Berlin Wall, and he said, Mr. Gorbachev, I challenge you, turn down this wall. And the third event of this magnitude, we had the opportunity to see in Kiev, when the leader of the free world felt the need to show his solidarity with those who were fighting for the principles on which the free world is based. And there is a very strong coalition, uh, at least thus far, supporting Ukraine, led by the NATO countries, including Poland, in, support, in supporting Ukraine. At the same time, there's a fair amount of the rest of the world that is sat on the sidelines, if I can put it that way. Right now, the United Nations is taking up a resolution to, to call for the end of the conflict there. Uh, it may be deciding even today on that resolution. What is the significance of getting the rest of the world on board, and what are the prospects for getting the rest of the world on board? Well. I suppose that the world as a whole needs the rules on which the world order is based. And this is something that we in the West, especially we in Central and Eastern part of Europe, are very well aware of. We know from our own history what kind of danger is being posed by any kind of imperialism. And we have enormous experience, with, first with Russian, then with Soviet, and now again with the imperialism of Russian Federation. The main problem is, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, that it's still very vulnerable to the Russian propaganda and Russian disinformation. We recall that at the times of the Soviet Union, this country was uh, presenting itself as a defender of those who were suffering from the colonial experience. The point is that this kind of rhetoric is still uh, working in some countries, in some societies of the so-called Deep South whether in Africa or in Latin America and so on. But exactly the opposite is the case. Now Russia is the last empire mm. which is conducting imperial policies mm. that have everything in common with the past colonial experience. And the trick is that this obvious truth should be much better known mm. Uh, outside Europe and outside the United States. Mr. Foreign Minister, as a representative of a country that is very close to the front lines, I say, uh, what would you say is the thing that is most needed by Ukrainians, and by the way, for Poland as well? What do you need in terms of further support for Ukraine and also for Poland? For Ukraine, what is necessary is to support them with everything they need. And it's up to them to define their needs. Mm. Uh, so, of course, we are talking about military support, about the humanitarian uh, aid, and of course, and of course, what is needed is our funds for the reconstruction of Ukraine after the war. This is one issue. The other issue, as far as the Ukrainian needs are concerned, we have to realize that the Ukrainians are fighting for values that we all share. So it's up to the Ukrainians to define the preconditions of the peace agreement mm. or even peace negotiations with the Russians. They're fighting for their own 
-hmm. territorial integrity. So it's necessary to leave them to them to decide when they are ready to sit down at the negotiation tab uh, table with, with, uh, uh, with the Russians. That's terrific. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you being here and for all of your work. That is Zbigniew Rao. He's the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Poland. Coming up, we're going to go through the continuing saga of that grand jury in Georgia with Bloomberg's Eric Larson. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. You might think that the 2020 election is over, but we're still litigating about it, certainly in a grand jury proceeding down in Georgia. As we know, a special grand jury has returned a report and apparently recommended some indictments come. But now we have her hearing from the foreperson, the woman who led the special grand jury, and it's caused quite a stir. To bring us up to speed, welcome now Eric Larson, who covers courts and politics for Bloomberg. Thank you for being here, Eric. So tell us about this. This is quite a saga. It is. It was pretty unexpected. The the forewoman of this jury, her name is Emily Coors. She's 30 years old, and she sort of surprised everyone by uh, going on a bit of a media tour, uh, explaining to uh, reporters and going on TV, explaining what sort of went on, not, necessar not necessarily the deliberations, but just the inner workings of the grand jury and just some quirky things that happened. It just sort of left everyone kind of stunned about why uh, she was going public with this kind of detail on such a you know, politically charged case. Do we know, was this legal? Can she do this? I mean, if it was a federal grand, grand jury, and this is a special grand jury, but a federal grand jury, that's all very secret stuff. You're not supposed to do that. It is very secret, and the deliberations, as far as we know, uh, haven't really been revealed. Uh, but. Uh, we've had legal experts point out that in Georgia, this special grand jury, their recommendations, if the state decides to run with them, would seek indictments from another grand jury. So it's a, an, another layer removed from an injur, a grand jury that would actually issue indictments. So that gives a little bit more protection to what's going on here. It's kind of bad optics for the district attorney, of course. Uh, but there's still another layer of protection with this other grand jury that would need to be called on to uh, issue any actual indictments. But there are those. Some of them might even have formerly been president of the United States who have claimed this is all political anyway. Uh, and if, in fact, there is an indictment, if, in fact, they go to a trial, you can bet that that's going to get raised. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've spoken with uh, legal experts who normally are very, you could say, like critical of Trump and his legal maneuvers and whatnot, um, who nevertheless agree with Trump that it was kind of inappropriate what Ms. Coors did. Um, just because of, like I said, the optics and how it complicates things for the district attorney in any potential future criminal cases. Uh, but they also said that despite those bad optics and sort of the bad you know, decision making there, perhaps, um, that it's very unlikely that it would undermine any potential indictments because, like I said, there's that other grand jury that's going to hear the evidence here, and the judges are really going to look at the weight of the evidence and how that might balance out against any problematic, you know, results of this forewoman. We should point out uh, what I believe is the case. Donald Trump, the former president himself, is not subject of this investigation, right? These are other individuals. He is being investigated, uh, and this is a criminal investigation, and a lot of people actually do expect that he could be indicted here. Um, the difference is that he wasn't called to testify before this special grand jury, while a lot of other people were, including Rudy Giuliani and the, uh, yeah. the mayor of Georgia, and, and, and oh, sorry, the governor of Georgia. So, so there is potential here for Trump to be charged, and that's why oh, you saw him sort of lash out <laughs> with uh, his statement he put out about this uh, this four woman speaking, calling it a kangaroo court and and things like that. But uh, he has said that he was exonerated in this case after that earlier. Uh, report excerpts came out, right. um, even though there were no recommendations, were not made public, yeah, just yeah, excerpts, and yeah, he claimed a total yeah. exoneration. And when this forewoman yeah. was asked about that, right. she kind of laughed and said, that's <laughs> funny. Okay, thank you so much to Bloomberg's Eric Larson. Thanks so much for being here. Check out the Balance Power newsletter on the terminal, also online. Coming up, Balance Power will continue on Bloomberg Radio. And this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. <laughs> 